anyway, with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and get going. Um, only thing of note that I had was um, some chapter updates. Um, so we have posted all of the prior meetings for this year, um, except with the exception to uh, September and October, because those uh, files um, have been lost but un, uh, un, under uh, unfortunate circumstances. But that being said, there's still the hurricane forecasting workshop. You still got the mental health uh, meeting from last month. Um, and a, a whole assortment of other things, as well as the tornado forecasting workshop from 2015. So plenty to, to binge watch during these, uh, in these times. Um, also, we uh, just had our officer board meeting last, um, last week and passed the redefinition of the active member to where the uh, service event is only required for one, uh, you only have to do one service event per year. Um, and each additional service event will be applied to your uh, attendance to basically make up for any missed meetings. Um, and also, uh, based off of just looking at the uh, raw poll data, it looks like uh, there's a pretty overwhelming support for a new t-shirt design. So uh, that will probably be something the officer board will prioritize uh, and look at for the fall. Um, so getting back to the spring election results, I'll be getting that uh, situated throughout the meeting um, and hopefully we'll have results for you guys uh, by the end of it. Um, and then other things to note is uh, that this spring election does not include um, appointed positions like webmaster historian or deputy of media. So if you're interested in those positions, uh, definitely hit me up or uh, the, the next board over the summer or uh, during this, the end of the semester. Um, I'd highly recommend those are definitely really good ways to get your foot in the door with the officer board. Um, and also the grad, represent, uh, grad rep position will be uh, also in the fall with the freshman reps. Um, so that'll be up for election uh, at the first meeting next, next semester. So uh, just things to keep in mind moving forward. Um, so I, I really don't have anything else extra to note. Um, so I'll go ahead and give the uh, floor to uh, Dr. David Bodin and he'll uh, go over uh, his work and uh, hopefully uh, we, we learn quite a few new things about tornado debris signatures and, and things like that with radar. So I'll let him, let me stop sharing and I'll let him take over. All right, does that work? Does that work? Yeah, I should be able to get it in the... Okay, are you able to see that okay? Hey, uh, thanks again, Tyler, uh, uh, for the invitation to come and speak today. And I certainly uh, appreciate the opportunity to, especially given the circumstances, to still be able to come talk to you about some cool things that we're doing in our radar group uh, about uh, research on dual polarization signatures of tornadoes, as well as some of the some of the cool simulations that we're also also doing. So uh, very briefly, I just want to mention that uh, this work wouldn't be possible without a lot of a lot of uh, collaboration from many different people, uh, many of them are, whom I collaborated with, scientists as well as uh, students who contributed to this work. So I want to I'll start out maybe a little bit less conventionally with uh, by talking a little bit about my path to becoming a research scientist. I was a OU undergraduate student, so maybe many of you can kind of see a, a possible path that, that you might take in your careers and what's possible to do with, with your degree from OU. Let's talk about uh, mobile radar technology and our, our radar lab. So we've developed a lot of really neat uh, radar systems that uh, provide some really unique data in the scientific community so we can understand severe weather better. And, uh, and then we're gonna talk about uh, uh, tornado research uh, that we've done through observations and simulations. So it includes severe weather research we've done with our phased array mobile radar, as well as uh, our tornado debris signature studies, uh, both some of the observation studies and some of the simulations. So going all the way back, I became interested in meteorology because I was scared of tornadoes. I grew up in the Kansas City area. I turned into a lifelong interest in weather. Uh, that kind of an unconventional path, or well, sort of, I spent my first year as a business major at K-State, not really sure what I was doing. And then I came to OU uh, for meteorology in 2004. I was basically on, on a meteorology track after that. 
So a couple of, wanted to highlight a few of the most impactful experiences in my undergraduate and graduate studies. Um, one, of, one of the things uh, I did was I worked with Dr. Patrick Klein on a nocturnal boundary layer research. And we looked at the structure of cold pools that developed around Lake Thunderbird. So there's kind of a gentle slope um, that leads down to the lake. So we looked at how the temperature varies along the slope. We found that there's these really strong nocturnal cold pools that would develop on some nights, uh, some nights and not others. So we looked at the climatological factors that affected those. But that's, uh, the undergraduate research is really where I learned to do research for the first time. It was a really important experience, uh, learning how to program, learning how to write, uh, even uh, ended up publishing some of this work. Uh, so it was a really cool experience. Uh, I was really appreciative of uh, Dr. Klein. So if you have an opportunity uh, to find a, somebody to do research with as an undergraduate student, I would really encourage that. Uh, the next one, uh, uh, studying abroad at the University of Reading was another really impactful experience. Uh, being able to go and learn about meteorology in a, a different country, look at you know, synoptic maps, in England and, and learn about weather patterns in a different place. Uh, it's really a cool experience. And I know the world's kind of crazy right now, so it's kind of hard to envision you know, studying abroad. But you know, at some point, hopefully in the near future, things return to normalcy. And so please take advantage of these opportunities, whether it's in your undergraduate or, or graduate studies. They're really unique experience. You get to see a lot of the, a lot of the world uh, as part of it too. So as a, a graduate student, one of the, the coolest things I, uh, maybe the most important experience I think was participating in field experiments with mobile radars. Uh, this is a, a video here of the air scanning uh, a wall cloud off in the distance We're on some crappy gravel road. Uh, I don't think the storm really did much, but just sort of one of the stock videos that we have of radar scanning. Here's me doing uh, something. Uh, this is one of the animations we have of the data we collected with the air. This is the Shawnee, Oklahoma tornado in 2013. So it's an EF4 tornado. So you can see how rapidly this uh, tornado is evolving in the structure. You can even see a big loop that it does over here. Uh, so this is a really cool experience. Uh, I was able to, uh, partic able to work on a radar system that was first of its kind. So this is imaging radar is a phased array radar. Um, that was the first of its kind as a mobile system and for weather observations. So we had to collect some really neat observations. And we've collected uh, for each year since uh, 2011, we've collected about 10 to 15 uh, severe weather cases with that system. So pretty cool uh, opportunities to within the radar group to, to take those systems out and do some cool research with the data. And I'll talk about some of that data later. Uh, the other impactful experience is the, the May 10th tornado outbreak. This produced uh, over 50 tornadoes in central Oklahoma and really spurred my interest in dual polarization radar signatures of tornadoes. Uh, this is an example of the tornado debris signature on May 10th. Uh, you can see this area, high radar reflectivity factor, uh, Doppler velocity couplet where you have a tornado vortex signature, and co-located with that a large area of reduced correlation coefficient, which is an uh, indication of a lofted debris in the tornado as well as uh, a near zero or, or low ZDR, especially compared to the surrounding precipitation. So uh, my, a lot of my PhD research focused on analyzing the characteristics of the TDS and looking at how they're related to damage surveys and debris. And we also uh, conducted uh, numerical simulations. And some of the work we focused on, especially trying to see what is the relationship between the tornado EF rating and the TDS height by looking along the track and seeing how as the, the tornado evolved, how did the, the TDS height or maximum reflectivity change? And how can we relate that to uh, estimating what the, the tornado's intensity and how much damage is occurring in real time? Uh, another really impactful e experience, uh, I did a, a six month stay in Japan to learn about a large eddy simulation model for tornado research. So we uh, use this model to simulate the flow of the tornado. So this is a multiple vortex tornado here. You can see a couple of the really strong multiple vortices uh, there, as well as the enhanced vertical motions associated with those. Um, so some really cool experiences. Got to see a lot of really neat Japanese temples, go to sumo wrestling events. Uh, and some of the research uh, that has come out of this has uh, contributed my research funding that I even currently have. So it was a really important experience for me. So, so getting out, whether it's uh, visiting another university, 
in the United States or abroad during your graduate studies is something that could be really, really beneficial and kind of learning some kind of new technique or, or meeting new people. Let's see, it looks like it's frozen up here on me for a second. Okay. So uh, since 2016, I've been working at the radar group as a research scientist. So uh, my, my job responsibilities and involve kind of a range of things, but primarily using the radar resources that we have to do scientific research. So we take the radars out on field experiments, uh, collect data, and then come back and analyze the, the data from those experiments. So that's a lot of the work that myself and my students are doing. We also, uh, another important role is publishing and presenting research findings. Uh, also mentoring graduate and undergraduate students. Uh, acquiring funding is a big thing because that really determines what kind of research you're able to do. Uh, in general, I found that I've been able to, um, you can write proposals to do the, the things that you really enjoy and in general are able to do those, end up working on those projects. So it's pretty rewarding experience when those projects get funded. So uh, also I manage the mobile radar program for the radar group here. So it's uh, so fairly wide range of responsibilities, but I'd say the, most, the best part of the job is getting to take the radars out and study severe weather and come back, analyze the data, see what we can learn, but also being out in the field, seeing the storm that you're going to end up studying is pretty cool too. Also getting a chance to work with great students and watching them develop into scientists is another part of my job that I, I really enjoy. Uh, one of the things that uh, is, is important, especially for my job and probably a lot of research jobs, is we do a lot of scientific writing. So uh, one of the most important skill sets is, is ability to write. So I'd say on average, write three to five papers per year, either, uh, either by myself or in collaboration with other people. Sometimes it's more of a contributing role, sometimes it's more of a lead role. And the same thing with uh, scientific research proposals. Uh, we'd, you, get, you write uh, quite a few of those so you can be able to have enough funding and do the research that you wanna do. So now I'm going to talk about the radar technology within the, the radar lab at OU. So the Advanced Radar Research Center started in 2005. It's located in the radar lab, uh, radar innovations laboratory, which is located east of the weather center. So if you're in the, in the weather center parking lot and you look out to the east, there's a building with some mobile radars and a vehicle bay, and you can see where the radar lab is. Uh, it's, the radar lab is, or our radar group is the largest academic radar program in the country. We have 110 faculty, staff, and students. And the primary goal is to bring scientists and engineers together so we can create radar technology aimed at solving interdisciplinary science challenges. So that started out um, only in meteorology when the radar group first, and it's expanded into other areas like aviation, uh, defense applications. So it's uh, many different aspects of radar, but still kind of the heart of it is in meteorology. So that's really the core, we develop a lot of mobile radar systems for, for weather applications. Okay, bear with me one minute. Looks like we got another stalled again. Uh, so one of the mobile radars we have is called the Atmospheric Imaging Radar, called the AIR. Uh, this is an example of some of the data we collected on, on May 31st, 2013 in El Reno, or near El Reno, Oklahoma. So this is uh, the world's, uh, they're the largest tornado on record. Uh, so it's really impressive data. You can see with the, this is five second updates. We're basically seeing the entire storm all at once. And you can see these uh, areas of really high reflectivity uh, sending in the center of the tornado it might be debris or some, something that's kind of uh, uh, quick, very, very rapidly ascending within the updraft region. You also see some other substructure uh, within the storm. You can see the weak echo column uh, uh, extends deep into this uh, supercell. Uh, so the atmospheric imaging radar uh, was the first radar to use an imaging technique to study uh, for weather observations. So we were the, the first group to apply it for severe weather studies. 
It's also the first phased array radar built by OU. And so the radar works by, it transmits a wide fan beam, and then we form multiple uh, simultaneous receive beams. So the, the fan beam allows us to scan all the way from near the bottom of the storm, all the way toward the top of the storm, and do that all at once. So we send out this broad pulse that covers the whole area. But then on receive, we can get really detailed information by forming multiple receive beams all up and down the storm. So we still get really fine resolution data, even though we've transmitted our, our radar beam over a really wide space. So it's a pretty cool technique. It allows us just to scan back and forth, and in five to 10 seconds, you get a full volume of data. So another uh, radar system we have is called the PX-1000. Uh, this radar, probably our coolest data set we collected was on May 20th, 2013. Uh, this is an example of the data we collected. So if you watch along here, you can see a, a dual polarization tornado debris signature. And one of the cool things about this data set was you, uh, you could really clearly see the tornado debris signature, and then you also see these ejections of debris emerging from the tornado debris signature. So you can see kind of these spiral bands that eject out of the tornado debris signature. Uh, you can also see a, a nice loop or a loop that the tornado does. Uh, a little bit later on in its life cycle. So the tornado comes up here and then it'll do a loop around there. So we had 20 second scans for this particular storm. So it gave us really fine detail uh, about what the, the tornado was, was doing and some of the evolution of it. So the PX-1000, it's an X-band dual pole radar. Uh, it uses solid state transmitters, which are, are lower, more reliable and lower cost than a lot of other options. Uh, the radar uh, has a 1.8 degree beam width, so it's not as fine of resolution as a lot of other systems. Uh, it's on, mounted on the back of a trailer, so we can tow it and bring it many different places. Uh, this is an example of uh, some of the field experiments we've done around the world. Uh, so we have radars in South Korea making uh, winter precipitation measurements uh, six or seven years ago. Uh, with all, radar's also been deployed to Peru where we made uh, measurements of orographic precipitation. Uh, so they were evaluating the benefits of a weather radar network for Peru. So the PX-1000 was brought up into the mountains for that. Uh, each year since uh, 2015, we've also taken the radar up to Colorado and mounted it uh, up in the, or near Durango. And we also took the radar out during the Plains Elevated Convection and Night Experiment, went all around the plains, uh, studying mesoscale convective systems and other nocturnal phenomena. So another uh, a mobile radar that we have is the RaxPole. It's a mobile X-band dual-pole radar. It's capable of scanning 180 degrees per second, so it rotates really fast. So it can do uh, 10 elevation angle scans in 20 to 25 seconds. So if you think about the time it takes for uh, an X-rad radar to do a volume scan, it's about five minutes. So it's, these are really fast volume scans, and it can do a comparable number of elevation angles in uh, a fraction of the time. This is some data uh, published by Howie Bluestein. Uh, this is uh, May, uh, May 31st, uh, 2013, El Reno supercell. Uh, you, can see a super, or you can see the evolution of the tornado and some really rapidly evolving uh, structure within the Hook Echo region especially, uh, as well as some of these precipitation bands that are pretty dynamically evolving as the tornado forms. So one of, the, one of the things that makes RaxPole work is that it transmit, uses a technique called frequency hopping. So instead of transmitting at the same frequency over and over, which is what an X-RAD does or most radars do, the RaxPole will transmit two, frequent, two pulses at one frequency, then it'll change the uh, frequency, transmit two pulses, and then it'll change the frequency again, and it keeps doing that. And then you can combine all those samples, which will be independent. So you can get uh, independent samples faster that way, and that allows you to get higher data quality in a shorter period of time, so you can scan much faster than you could with a typical radar system. Uh, another really interesting technology that's a, a brand new system that we're, we've developed within the radar group is called a passive bi-static radar. And this is a picture of the radar. So the radar, all it does is receive uh, data from another radar. So that's why we call it passive. It's not actually transmitting uh, anything. So in this case, we're collecting data from the next rad radar. And since we're not in the same location as the next rad radar, we actually get a different uh, measure, a different component of the wind than the next rad's measuring. 
So we're able to use that information to construct the wind field. So it's kind of like doing a dual Doppler analysis where you have two radars in different places and the beams are oriented in different directions where you're observing the velocities, uh, velocity components in a different angle. Uh, this radar system does something similar, except there's no need to transmit uh, a radar beam because you can just re you receive the data from the next rad. So this is the first in instrument capable of doing multi-Doppler 3D wind retrievals using Nexrad. And the cool thing about this is it's really cheap. It's like five to $20,000 uh, to build one of these units. So it could be a really low cost way to deploy and make three-dimensional wind measurements all across the country with Nexrads. So really exciting potential. And this pairing with the spaced array could get uh, really fast scan 3D data, which would be neat. Uh, it looks like I got a froze up again on me. I think it's bogging down with the animations. So uh, briefly uh, talk about uh, what's on the next slides as it's uh, as it's coming up. Um, so we're we've kind of or the we recently retired the atmospheric imaging radar, the phased array. So we have a couple of new uh, dual polarization phased array radars that are coming into the radar group in the next year. So that'll be a, a really exciting opportunity to work with these uh, new radar systems and take those out and collect some first of its kind uh, uh, dual polarization and phased array. Uh, radar data. So I'm going to go ahead and just start this from. OK. So the other technolo uh, technology this, that I'm describing is called the PAIR. It's a polar metric atmospheric imaging radar. And this is going to be a phased array radar that it's dual polarization. So be capable of scanning really fast and also making dual polarization radar measurements. So we'll be able to take this all around the country to collect observations of tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, uh, various forms of convection, and so on. Uh, so why do we need a, such a fast scanning radar? This is a dual polarization simulation that we've done of a tornado debris signature during tornado genesis. These are every six seconds, but you can see how quickly the debris field evolves during uh, just a short period of time, including how rapidly it develops at tornado genesis. Uh, likewise, you can also see how rapidly the tornado vortex signature develops. It goes from being pretty well un poorly defined to having a pretty tight couplet uh, during tornado genesis. So see the evolution of the tornado, understand how tornado genesis occurs, understand the evolution of the debris field. We need really fast radar scans, and in these dual polarization phased arrays will allow us to do that. The other technology is called HORUS. This is an S-band all digital phased array. So what's uh, really neat about this system is first of all, it's at the same frequency as NEXRAD. So when we eventually replace NEXRAD with a phased array, well, we can, uh, this radar will serve as a prototype for that because we're transmitting the same radar frequency. Uh, so we can look at this, the phenomenon in a similar manner. So it's a mobile system. So unlike a lot of the phased arrays, that have been at S band that have been, or NSSL had at, um, or, uh, at the airport in North Norman. Uh, those radars are fixed, so they're not able to, to go and mobily observe different phenomena. Whereas this system, we can take it all around the, all around the United States and observe different phenomena. So it allows us a lot of flexibility. Though what's particularly neat about it is that it's an all digital array, which gives us like, basically unprecedented flexibility in how we can scan. So we can re redesign scanning strategies so we can prioritize different regions of the storm and scan them much faster than other areas that we don't care as much about. So we can get even faster scans in the areas that are important. We can also use air style scans where we transmit these wide beams and basically get all of this data back all at once so we can scan really fast. And there's a variety of other techniques this allows us to do in a, a pretty unique fashion. 
So next, I'm going to talk about observations of severe storms uh, from our the atmospheric imaging radar. So this is the mobile radar, uh, mobile phased array radar that we that was built by OU, or the first or the first phased array built at OU, uh, built within the radar group. So the the main goals we've had with this system <clears throat> are focused primarily around a, a severe weather. So we wanted to collect first of its kind, vertically continuous volumes of mobile radar data in supercells and tornadoes. So most radars kind of sequentially scan. So they start at a low elevation, then they keep going up sequentially. So they might go from one to two to three to five to 10 degrees to 20 degrees. Whereas this radar gets everything in all in one shot. So it goes from, gets data with a 20 degree swath all at once. So it gives you vertically continuous data so you can see the structure in a really unique way without having to make some assumptions about, okay, maybe the storm, you don't have to pretend like the storm didn't change when you know it did. Uh, it basically is giving you all that structure almost instantly. So we wanted to understand how the mesocyclone and the tornado are evolving with time, and especially uh, how the mesocyclone evolves during tornado genesis, as well as uh, uh, for tornado cases of tornado genesis failure, why does that happen, and what is kind of the vertical structure of the mesocyclone in those cases. Also, we want to understand the evolution of the tornado uh, as well through its full life cycle and into dissipation. So tornado genesis studies, uh, one of the main questions scientists have had are, is how do tornadoes form? And this is still something that's not particularly well known. There's a lot of various theories on tornado formation. Um, but one of the most basic ways to understand tornado formation is, is it an upward process or is it, is it a downward process? So early theories uh, contended that the tornadoes formed uh, by rotation that built up aloft and then built downward. Uh, this is called the dynamic pipe effect. Uh, so the question is, do tornadoes form from aloft or then build down, or do they form from the surface and build upward? So this is uh, a study that's uh, uh, currently being done by uh, Casey Griffin, who's uh, soon to be a, a professor at SUNY Brockport. He was a PhD student at OU. Uh, he's looking at the evolution of uh, the storm, or tornado, uh, looking at the evolution of this uh, tornado as it formed. And one of the things he found was uh, this tornado first went under kind of a brief intensification, then a weekend, but then it re-intensified uh, more substantially uh, all over in a period of about two or three minutes. And looking at that in a little more detail, Okay, looking at that in a little bit more detail, uh, this is a plot of the rotational intensity as a function of time and as a function of height. So here we're going from zero to four kilometers and we're looking at a period of about four minutes. So when that tornado initially strengthens, the strengthening was very shallow. So it was only about maybe one, one and a half kilometers deep. Uh, where, and then it briefly weakens. And then it uh, very abruptly uh, begins to intensify, but intensifies over basically the whole column that we observe. Uh, initially over a column about 2.5 kilometers deep, and then the intensification kind of ascends upward uh, with time after that. So this, uh, this and as well as some other observations from Raxpole kind of provide mounting evidence that tornadoes seem to form in a column or a relatively close to surface and then build upward in time. And this contrasts a lot of the early theories of tornado genesis where tornadoes uh, develop in a descending fashion. We've also uh, taken, used the air data to look at some tornado genesis failure cases. Uh, so in some cases, we observed rapidly intensifying rotation. You can see it visually. The mesocyclone starts rotating faster, but a tornado doesn't form. Uh, so on 21 May uh, 2014, the, we observed a tornado worn case with strong rotation, but it didn't produce a tornado. This is an example of how the Doppler velocity couplet evolved over that time at low levels. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is you can see a brief intensification of rotation near the surface, but it, it's basically decoupled from everything that's going on above it. Uh, so in that case, it may be, as well as maybe they're the pre-tornadic uh, part of the tornado genesis case I just showed, where rotation was shallow, it seems one of the factors that may inhibit tornado genesis is if rotation doesn't extend uh, sufficiently deep into the storm. 
Uh, so that seems to be a, a common feature that we're seeing in a lot of this uh, rapid scan data. Also, I uh, looked at the dissipation of the tornadoes. So this is a, a, a strong tornado we observed that was initially uh, about a kilometer wide with multiple subvortices, and it dissipated over about a period of five minutes. Uh, so a tornado basically went from looking like this to a weakening about midway through, uh, like kind of a classic rope tornado. Uh, here you can see a, a very wide uh, diameter tornado. You can see it dissipating in the animation and then it starts to kind of slowly rotate around. So uh, looking at a similar plot, this is uh, the rotational intensity again as a function of time and height. So initially the tornado is relatively strong. The difference in the out, outbound and inbound winds is over 100 meters per second. And you can see it uh, weakening with time uh, as you go forward. But the weakening happens a lot. It happens above 1.25 kilometers first and then kind of weakens in a downward fashion toward the surface. And then as the tornado fully dissipates, we see the weakening happening right at the ground and then proceeding in an upward manner. Okay. Okay, is everybody still able to see this? So next, yeah. uh, I'm going to talk about uh, tornado debris signatures. So first, I want to just very briefly mention uh, what some of the dual polarization measurements are. So the, most, the one you're most familiar with is reflectivity or radar reflectivity factor. And this is related to the size or concentration of scatters, raindrops, for example, or in the case of tornado uh, debris. So if you have larger or debris or higher concentrations of debris, you'd have higher radar reflectivity factor. Uh, differential reflectivity is related to the shape of the objects. Uh, so it's a ratio of the horizontal and vertical radar reflectivity factors. So if you have a, a spherical object, the, the horizontal polarization is going to scatter back the same amount of energy as the vertical polarization. So the radar reflectivity factors end up being the same, which produ produces a ZDR of 0 dB, which in linear units is 1, so they're equal to each other. So ZDR is a, a ratio of the, the horizontal and vertical reflectivity factors, and then dB is the log 10 of that. So for uh, large grain drops, you get more power back from the horizontal dimension because the, the drops are ablate, or they have a larger major axis than they do a minor axis. So because of this, you get more a higher reflectivity factor in the horizontal than the vertical, and you have a positive ZDR. So then the, the most important variable for uh, tornado debris signatures is the copolar co cross-correlation coefficient, or rho HV. But sometimes you'll hear it just referred to as correlation coefficient. And the, the numeric value of this looks similar to like a correlation coefficient you see in statistics from zero to one. It's a, so for, for the, in this case, it's a measure of how correlated the radar signals that are coming back from the horizontal polarization and the vertical polarization are. So, if those signals are really well correlated, you'll get a value close to one. If they're not correlated, then you get a value close to zero. So cases where you get high correlation are, for example, if you have small raindrops everywhere and they're all similar sizes. So if your volume has really similarly shaped objects and they're all small, you'll get high correlation coefficient. A case where you get low correlation coefficient would be if you have, uh, for example, large hailstones. So if you have large objects, a mix of objects like rain and hail, or if you have objects that are regularly shaped or buried in composition, rho HV will decrease. Sorry, it looked like I had another, another stall. Okay, uh, to so tornado debris signatures are signature, polarimetric signatures of lofty debris. So there's an example of uh, two tornado debris signatures that were occurring at the same time on May 10th over here on this image here. So you can see very high reflectivity associated with both of these, uh, higher reflectivity associated with the one to the west. 
Um, also can see an area of very low correlation coefficient associated with both of these. So we have a lot of really large, regularly shaped objects, a wide range of different object shapes, and that's going to produce low correlation coefficient. Also in TDSs, you tend to have near zero ZDR, and you can see here ZDR values tend to be close to zero. Uh, in some cases, ZDR can be negative, which may be re the results of debris being somewhat uh, commonly aligned in the tornado. And one of the most imp uh, important applications of TDSs is that it can be useful for remotely detecting tornadoes, as well as providing some estimate of damage severity in the near real time. So uh, this case in particular is interesting. It's, uh, this is also work by Casey Griffin, uh, just published in Monthly Weather Review. And uh, we could, we, he looked at the differences between these two signatures. So we did find that the tornado to the west was more intense. So some of the reason for the differences in the polar metric signatures was the intensity of the tornado. So one of the things that we wanted to extract, extract out with the research is what are, what's responsible for the differences in the TDSs? We have TDSs here that are basically over the same land cover, but they look quite different from each other. <laughs> so what's the difference between those two, and how does that relate to, say, the winds or the debris that's in the tornado? So uh, looking at, uh, going back to some of the first studies that we did looking at this, um, we did a study in 2013 uh, looking at the relationship between the tornado debris signature and the long track damage. So we looked at the EF scale rating and how that correlated with area, volume, TDS height. And it generally found that larger areas, TDS volumes, uh, TDS heights were associated with more intense tornadoes. Uh, likewise, as we, uh, we also looked at uh, kind of an initial sample of uh, cases from central Oklahoma events, um, about 20 or so, and found that there is a general correlation between TDS height and uh, EF rating. So the more intense tornadoes uh, tended to have higher TDS heights and also larger TDS volumes. And that's been confirmed by, by uh, uh, additional studies uh, by Matthew Vandenbroek, uh, Sam Emerson, and others uh, that have looked at much larger sample sizes as once the ADPs became polar metric everywhere. Uh, another interesting, uh, some other interesting relationships, uh, long distance debris transport's always been attributed to strong and violent tornadoes as being more likely to produce a long distance debris transport. And you can see this with the dual polarization radars. Uh, this is a case from last year, uh, Linwood, Kansas EF4 tornado. And you can see the, the TDS uh, here uh, moving along I-70 east toward Kansas City. And it produced, the storm produces this large plume of debris that a low correlation that starts to extend and move northeast with time. And this plume of debris moved over the Kansas City International Airport and they ended up having to clear large amounts of debris off of the runway. Uh, there's, uh, here's a metal sheet. Uh, there are actually planes landing and taking off while debris was falling. So uh, clearly there would have been some nice to know that this was happening. Uh, so dual polarization data provides the opportunity to do that. So we're currently working on a study to, to uh, looking at debris fallout from this case and the context of airport operations. This is research being done by a high school student, uh, Eric Wong. Also uh, looked at the relationship between the TDS and tornado dynamics. So the increase in TDS height with higher EF rating implies that the tornado intensity is probably related to TDS characteristics. So to investigate this, we did a dual Doppler analysis with the May 10th uh, Moore, Oklahoma tornado data. And one of the interesting things that we found was we looked at vertical vorticity, so the, the rotation about the vertical axis, and row HV. And we found that the uh, TDS points with the lowest row HV tended to have the highest vertical vorticity. And those low row HV points were associated with subvortices within this particular tornado. So this is kind of a schematic diagram of, of subvortices rotating around the main tornado and row HV being the lowest in the center of the subvortices and kind of increasing outward. So you have kind of this broad area of low row HV, but some of these areas of, of relatively low, H, real, low row HV were associated with, uh, or were associated with subvortices. So that means that low row HV might mean that the subvortices are particularly strong winds and updraft producing more damage and increasing the amount of debris that are being lofted. So what are some of the factors that control the tornado debris signature? So we talked about a few of these, the three-dimensional winds in the tornado and its surrounding environment. So more intense tornadoes lofting more and greater debris. 
And then once those debris go up in the air, there's processes like the centrifuging of debris. Uh, so large particles get centrifuged outwards, whereas the small particles don't get centrifuged out as much. And uh, debris also fall out. So the largest pieces of debris don't go all the way up to the top of the storm. Usually they fall out uh, relatively quickly, whereas leaves and other small things can get lofted really far. So these various factors determine what the spatial distribution of debris sizes and concentrations are. This is an example of a schematic of a tornado with debris uh, by Roger Wakimoto. You see these large pieces of debris, mainly at low levels, uh, kind of decreasing in number, but you can also see that they kind of get centrifuged out and the core of the tornado has uh, much smaller particles than kind of the outside of the, the tornado where the particles have been centrifuged radially outward. So in addition to that, uh, each of these particles has kind of a complex uh, characteristic of how it reflects energy back to the radar. So each of their polar metric signals are gonna be quite different from each other. So it takes some relatively complex uh, uh, modeling to handle all these different components. We have the flow of the tornado, you can capture the processes of how the debris are flying, and you can also model what kind of reflections you get back from a wood board or a leaf or a rock and all these different kinds of debris. So to understand those factors, we developed a radar simulator that would uh, allow us to model these different things. So this uh, radar tool is called SimRadar. We developed it uh, to study polar metric signatures of tornadoes. So we uh, made laboratory measurements, or our community university made laboratory measurements of, uh, of debris, which provide the drag and the rotational characteristics of debris at different orientations. So we can see how different objects would uh, rotate as they fly or as they uh, move within the wind. So we can use this to compute what the trajectory of each piece of debris is, as well as what its orientation is. We also uh, calculated the radar cross-section measurements of different objects. Uh, we did this in an anechoic chamber where you can take an object and the anechoic chamber is, the sidewalls are, are made out of foam that's absorbent of, rad absorbs radar material, or absorbs radar waves so that you don't get a lot of reflections back. So you make very controlled measurements of what kind of reflections you get back from different objects. So we did this with wood boards as well as uh, some of these targets here that are metal. And then also we combine it with high resolution simulations of tornadoes. So this is a multiple vortex tornado simulation that we've done, uh, produces uh, four large uh, multiple vortices. Uh, this is based on the May 10th, uh, 2010 tornado. So this is an example of what some of the output looks like. This is the visualization. So these are pieces of debris that have been lofted by the tornado, and these small orange dots are, are raindrops. Now this is an example of the output of the radar data. So here you can see an area of very high reflectivity associated with the debris that have been lofted and low correlation coefficient, as we expect to see uh, in observations. So this is a, a visualization of, of SIM radar. So, um, Give it just a second here to queue up. So there, uh, here you can see a piece of debris that are getting swept into the tornado and then lofted uh, quite high in some cases, as well as uh, a blue blue dots here that represent raindrops. And you can see the overall swirling motion. So it seems to capture a pretty realistic. Uh, realistic motions of particles in tornadoes. And then, so let's skip ahead. This is a top-down view. Um, you can see some areas where the debris are rotating faster as it, within the subvortices of the tornado, uh, as well as some areas that are relatively hollow where there's a relative sparse number of particles associated with centrifuging. So some of the questions we're addressing with SimRadar is one thing we want to know is how does the tornado debris signature relate to debris characteristics? So is it is the TDS related to size and concentration as we've uh, hypothesized from our observational data? Uh, one of the big challenges with uh, tornadoes is that from observations, we don't know exactly how many two by fours or how many cows or how many different objects are in the tornado. So this allows us to get an idea uh, where we can simulate those things and get an idea of, uh, of these relationships in a very controlled manner. So we can put 1,000 two by fours or 10,000 two by fours in the simulation and see how the signature changes. Uh, so one example of this, uh, here's a simulation of leaves. 
uh, looking at the row HV. So you can see it does produce lower row HV, but not super low values. And then this is the case with small plywood sheets. So you can see it produces some more coherent and uh, a greater decrease in correlation coefficient compared to the leaf case, uh, which is something we expect is, uh, confirms the hypothesis that as debris size increases, we get a lower row HV values. Now these are some pro vertical profiles of row HV. Uh, again, the, the wood boards have some of the lowest row HV near the surface. The row HV though does increase as you go up in height. Uh, because the, large, the wood boards don't get lofted as high as the leaves. However, the, the leaves uh, have a lower slight, or they have kind of a modest value of low H, row HV. Uh, row HV for rain is kind of similar to the green curve here as, a, as you get way up high in the wood board simulation where there's no wood board, so it's close to one. But the leaves are, are below 0.9, so it's indica indicative of probably non-meteorological scatters. So here, the, uh, you can see the leaves, though, produce a deeper TDS than the wood boards, which produce a relatively shallow TDS. If those were the only uh, scatters that we had. Uh, another questions we're addressing with SimRadar. So we, from our observational hypotheses, we've noted that uh, the TDS is related to the dynamics of the tornado or its kinematic characteristics. But one of the hard things to do with uh, radar observations is measuring the 3D wind. So it's really hard to get in, uh, measurements of the vertical velocity in tornadoes. Uh, there's some uh, pretty crude techniques to do it that don't work very well. And in part, that's because, uh, because of uh, a bias that I'll talk about later uh, due to debris. But in general, uh, so some of the things we want to look at in sim radar. So I we found from observations that the TDS parameters are correlated with uh, near surface wind speeds. So we want to see for uh, an EF0 tornado we simulate and an EF5 tornado that we simulate, do we see differences in the TDSs? for those different uh, tornado intensities. Also, uh, we want to look at the patterns within the TDS to see if subvortices produce lower rate HV like we see in observations. And is that common with different uh, simulations? And then also, how does the TDS evolve throughout the life cycle? So from tornado genesis all the way through dissipation. So this is one example of a, a two-celled tornado with uh, where here the solid contours represent the updraft area. So it's kind of this annulus of updraft. And then in the center, there's an area of downdraft. So the uh, two cell vortex, a uh, one cell vortex is uh, an example of a tornado where you have updraft only. Uh, two cell vortex where you have both a downdraft in the center and then an updraft that surrounds it. So the, what's interesting here and was that the center of the tornado actually has relatively high row HV, whereas we have low row HV on the outside uh, co-located with the strongest updraft. So this is consistent with some of our observations. Uh, Casey uh, looked at a two-cell vortex uh, with Doppler velocity or Doppler radar data, and he did some analyses of uh, cross sections uh, or axisymmetric calculations where you average the data in an, in an axisymmetric pattern around the as a function of radius. So he found that there was actually uh, a slightly higher row HV in the center of the tornado than there is at the outer radius where this minima kind of starts near the surface and then kind of moves up radially outward consistent with the centrifuging of debris. Also, we've uh, uh, past studies uh, from our observational data, we've seen that uh, TDS area and height tend to increase as tornado damage severity or intensity increases. So we want to see if we can model that as well as sim radar and kind of look at the factors of, of that relationship. Is it how does it change if you have a tornado that moves from like no debris into an area with a lot of debris that's available, for example. So this is a case uh, where we've looked at delta V, which is the, a measure of rotational intensity. Uh, so this is a supercell simulation we use to simulate this uh, that resolves a, a really intense tornado. And it starts out with a, a delta V of about 50 meters per second, and then rapidly increases during tornado genesis and then it continues to increase in intensity throughout the rest of the simulation. And we can see that the TDS develops right around the time where tornado genesis occurs, and the delta V values are about 50 meters per second. And then the TDS uh, area continues to increase as the tornado continues to intensify. So it, it kind of it supports our hypothesis that the TDS area, as well as the height here going up to higher elevations, you start to see the TDS appear at uh, higher elevations 
once the tornado reaches more in or uh, reaches greater intensity. So one of the main reasons for this change is not just the intens intensification of the uh, wind speeds, the horizontal wind speeds, but also the vertical velocities in their ability to loft more and more debris. So finally, uh, the qu another question we're trying to address with our simulations is how do we estimate winds and tornadoes and how do we mitigate uh, the bias that's caused by debris? So one of the big problems uh, with Doppler velocity measurements of tornadoes is that with Doppler radars measure the wind speeds of the scatters in the tornadoes like debris rather than the air itself. And the debris can move at substantially different wind speeds than the air. This is an example of the difference between the uh, debris speed and the air speed. And you can see these, some of these are 40 meters per second. So that's like a EF1 tornado uh, difference in wind speed just because of the bias in the wind velocity. So you can get a, a really large difference in the velocities uh, because of this bias. So we need some way to correct it to get accurate wind measurements, as well as to be able to estimate all three components of wind speed. So we're using some radar. One of the promising techniques we're looking at is characterizing uh, using a, the Doppler spectrum. So the Doppler spectrum is basically looking at data as a function of Doppler velocity. So usually when you see a radar pixel, you see one value. So the wind speed in that radar pixel might be 10 meters per second. But the radar actually records a spectrum of velocity. So that tells you what the distribution of velocities is in the tornado. So it may not just be 10 meters per second, but there's some objects within your volume that are moving at 11 and 9 and 12 and 8 meters per second. And usually it, the peak kind of drops off as you go farther away, where at zero meters per, per second, maybe there's a couple scatters that are contributing, but not very many. So the idea here is because debris move at different speeds in the raindrops and debris have different polar metric characteristics in rain, we should be able to separate out where the debris are and the raindrops in the Doppler spectrum. So this is a potential technique where we could correct the wind speeds in the tornado uh, using some advanced uh, sig radar signal processing. So uh, in conclusion, uh, uh, kind of recapping everything, uh, the ARC has developed and deployed uh, many phased array and dual polarization mobile radars. Uh, we have several radars that are currently under develop and under development that are kind of the next generation systems, and those will be finished in the next year or so. Uh, one of the distinguishing features that we found from our analysis of the air data of uh, tornado genesis is the presence of, of rotation through a deep column. So in cases where you have uh, pre-tornadic vortices or a tornado genesis failure, the, the rotation doesn't tend to extend very deep into the storm. Also, we see with the air uh, a multi-layer dissipation process. So it first weakens in a top-down fashion, but then the, the final dissipation, when the, basically you, you lose sight of the funnel cloud and it's completely dissipated, occurs in a bottom-up manner. Also, uh, we've used numerical simulations to study tornado debris signatures, and we see similar characteristics to what we see in observations. Uh, these confirm many of our hypotheses, such as larger debris having lower correlation coefficient, or larger debris having lower correlation coefficient than small debris. So I'll, I'll leave the uh, conclusions up here, and I'll be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much for your time. Um, does, it, does anybody have any questions? Uh, just feel free to unmute yourself and give uh, your question to, to Dr. Bodine. Um, and then after that, uh, after we conclude, I will give uh, the election results, so. I've got a question. Okay. Um, is there a way to look at the velocity of the debris and then sort of use that to estimate the wind velocity? Yeah, if you, well, the tricky thing is, I mean, basically the, the velocity you measure is the velocity of the debris, but what you really want to know is the velocity of the rain or something really small in the tornado that moves very closely to the wind. Uh, there have been some studies. I think some of the highest vertical velocities ever measured in a tornado actually came from measurements of debris, but they weren't radar measurements. They were photogrammetry, so they looked at 
like track the particles in the tornado as they were ascending. Uh, but if you're able to separate out the two, then you then you would have the possibility of uh, being able to uh, see what the the real wind speeds are in the tornado. We can't hear you. Oh, you can't hear me? Okay. I just realized that I'm talking. <laughs> That's oh, okay. bad. It's a rookie mistake. No, I, sorry. Oh, thank you for letting me know. Um, no, I was going to ask, uh, there's no stupid questions, obviously. If you guys have uh, questions about applications regarding, uh, you know, even last weekend's event mm -hmm. um, or anything like that. I mean, obviously it's new, so it's not going to be super analyzed. But if there's anything that you observed or anything that you may have questions about, not a bad idea to ask or anything like that. Tyler, were you able to hear my response to the last one? Yes, question? yes. Sorry, yeah, that was on me. I, I muted myself again and then forgot. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, if there's no further questions, um, obviously, if you have uh, any other, like, last minute things you think about with regards to questions, but you can uh, direct message me and I can point you to uh, his email or his emails are actually right there on the slide too, if you need it. Mm -hmm. um, but feel free to, to uh, hit him up because he's, this is a really, really awesome. Um, this is a really, really awesome uh, research. And obviously, I mean, a lot of nerds here at uh, OU love tornadoes. So uh, it's right up you guys' alley. So I'm more of a hurricane guy, but I, I will, allow the <laughs> I will allow the <laughs> the uh, interest um, so that being said um, I if you don't mind I'll uh, share my screen again okay. um, and go ahead and, and share uh, I have the results for the 2020-2021 um, OU scan board um, and I will post them here one second let's see I'm gonna be able to, okay. And, all right, there you have it. So these are the results for the 2020, 2021 uh, OU Scan Officer Board. Um, thank you guys for your uh, feedback. It's gonna be really helpful for us moving forward. Um, can you guys hear me? I'm just making sure that I didn't mute myself again. There we go. Yeah, we're good. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say, I thank you guys so much for, for voting. Uh, all your feedback is going to be extremely, extremely useful for the next year's officer board. Um, and every, we'll definitely be taking your, your feedback uh, to heart and be able to uh, obviously make, you know, make things better for next year. And uh, I have strong faith in, in uh, the future officer board. Um, as far as the winners of uh, the elections, um, please, uh, let me know. I, I probably will contact Amanda here, uh, shortly. Um, and I'll probably will try to organize you guys, uh, so we can get together and have a first, uh, transition officer board meeting, uh, to kind of just go over, uh, things moving forward. Um, so it's kind of, it's going to be kind of wonky because obviously we can't necessarily be like, okay guys, meet after the meeting because there was no physical meeting here, but, um, We'll definitely make things work. Um, just stay in the loop, and uh, I'll hopefully be able to get all of you guys together, and we can um, organize a meeting uh, here in the next week or so. So uh, just stay tuned. Um, other than that, that's all I really have for you guys.